Good morning. Hey, morning. everybody. How's it going, Scott? Doing well. How about you, Joe? All right. Welcome, everybody, to this week. Um, it's been an eventful week. There's no doubt about it. But before we get started, we want to invite everybody to take off your hats <laughs> and start a watch party. Start a watch party. You can click at the bottom of the uh, box uh, that you're viewing. You'll see uh, start a watch party and you can you know, invite your friends to view this. Uh, share the socialist wealth. Uh, we strongly encourage you to uh, do that. Well, I said, Scott, it's been an eventful week. Did you watch the Democratic Party debates? And how did your homeboy, Joe Biden, uh, perform? <laughs> um, so I did not watch the debates. You know, I really Shame don't on like uh, watching speeches, watching debates. I prefer to, you know, read transcripts and stuff uh, mm -hmm. afterward. Uh, okay. I don't know why. Um, but there were some there were some great moments um, and something that was uh, brought out by an article in People's World uh, was that in the first debate, um, people were trying to CNN was trying to split uh, Warren against Sanders, pit them against one another, and they resisted that and, and put forward, you know, a, a much more united, um, extremely progressive uh, vision, which was terrific. Um, and you know, the thing that really stands out for me was, uh, I think it was John Delaney, um, you know, defending the sort of centrist moderate position. Oh, you know, pragmatism, we can't do this, we can't do that. You know, we need to be whatever. And uh, Elizabeth Warren just sort of stopped him and said, you know, I, I don't see why anybody would go through all the trouble of running for president just to tell us what we can't do. Um, yeah. And that, that was like that assertion that what we need is uh, political will and boldness and uh, to really take on the challenges facing us. I, I thought that was uh, that was terrific. He said, Quaidy, yes, we can. That's what yeah. won the election for Obama. That and hope, hope and real change. Uh, the mobilization of a whole bunch of, of new voters and young voters. Uh, so. But the issue is what programmatically is going to win this election and uh, the debate on uh, health care, it's an interesting one, is universal single payer Medicare for all the winning combination or will some people think that that's re uh, unrealistic and therefore not support the, uh, whoever is putting that idea forward and they're counterposing it to the union um, healthcare plans that have been negotiated. Mm -hmm. and they're saying that the workers, trade unionists are not going to have choice. That's. Yeah. I think that's that's nonsense. Um, uh, I mean, looking at something like uh, the New York Health Act, uh, which I'm not incredibly familiar with, but have you know been looking at a little bit. Um, it sounds like the standard for you know a, a comprehensive uh, public single payer system would be exactly the kind of, uh, of health care that, um, that union members and state employees get. Um, so I don't think, like, I think that that's fear mongering, you know. I think uh, so too. And then, you know, these plans, you know, number one, there's a lot of fine print in them. I found out. And then number two, no matter you know, whether it's bold print or, or fine to uh, fine print, when the rubber hits the road, the insurance companies are trying to maximize profits, you know? Yeah. So for example, my case, I needed a motorized scooter. I've had two, this would be my third or maybe my fourth edition. And I had a new insurance plan, low co-pays and all of that. I was really happy. I uh, could see any doctor that I wanted, but when I needed a piece of medical equipment, the goddamn insurance company said no. Four times they said no. That's ridiculous. You know, finally, this went on for six months. And finally, um, I had to appeal to an outside agency, state agency, uh, to yeah. overturn the decision of the insurance company. And these are doctors. That's, you know, that's horrible. So, so for months and months, you were without the medical equipment that you needed. 
Thank you. And, you know, and so it's, it's maximum profits. Mm -hmm. So when Elizabeth Warren was talking about the guy with ALS, mm -hmm. whose wife uh, was, you know, trying to raise money every which way she could because they had thousands of dollars in medical bills that the insurance companies wouldn't uh, cover. She knew what she was talking about. And, yeah. and uh, so better that coverage be guaranteed um, so that you don't have to jump through hoops in order to, you know. So you don't have to jump through hoops and so you don't have to worry about it. I mean, I feel like that's a, a basic, you know, piece of, of uh, peace of mind, dignity, whatever, that, you know, we should have in the wealthiest country in the world, you know, made wealthy by the labor of working people. Um, yes. we, we, nobody should have to worry about, you know, whether they can, get medical care and even worrying about like, oh, you know, uh, which, which plan is which, how do I, you know, go through this exchange or that. Simplify, simplify, simplify. Um, cover everybody, cover everything and, and have done with it. Yeah, the purpose of medicine should be to take care of people, not make, not make, uh, not make money. Now, the um, racism from the bully pulpit has increased daily. There's a steady barrage coming from uh, uh, the White House. Uh, you recently uh, wrote an editorial on that subject. What are you yeah. telling me? So um, you, can, uh, you can check out the editorial on our, our website. Um, it's called Time to Put the Racist in Chief in His Place. Um, and basically, it just points out that the sort of really the escalation of the white supremacy of Trump and, and his regime now targeting uh, progressive legislators of color, uh, Representative Elijah Cummings, um, uh, Alexandria Ocasio Cortez, Ilan Omar, Ayanna Presley, and Rashida Tlaib. Um, as um, and the, the 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 attack is the same in all of them, uh, accusing them of being from some you know, violent, dangerous, filthy hellhole and suggesting that they should, you know, go back there. For the squad, it was, you know, basically saying they're, they're foreigners. They should go back to where they came from. Uh, for Representative Cummings, it was um, he should go back to Baltimore, mm. um, spend more time in his district. Mm. It's just Trump saying, you know, progressive leaders of color, uh, black representatives, Latinx representatives don't belong in Washington, D.C. They don't belong in the people's house. Um, they don't belong in the country. Yeah. Well, I was stopped, me and my partner at the time in Jersey City, many years ago, uh, pulled over for a traffic stop. There was uh, words were exchanged that we didn't even know it was a cop. Turned hmm. out it was a racist, fascist cop. And that's what he said to me. Go back to Alabama. Go back to Africa. Go back, you know. Yeah, can you imagine uh, that's that's the mentality of the racist fascist and, right? Yeah, and, and using it and Trump, yeah, Trump's using it now in particular to see he's tapping into that that vein of white supremacy that go back where you came from and linking it to um, progressive uh, leaders, progressive policies, progressive ideas. Um, you know, you pointed out in an article recently that that anti communism and racism have always, you know, gone hand in hand. Um, and we're right. seeing that now. He's racializing progressive ideas, trying to, you know, turn people to, to convince people that, you know, uh, socialism, progressivism are these foreign threats embraced by, you know, dangerous dark skinned people and so forth. And um, somehow the um, point has to be made to the Democratic Party, to the moderates, to the center in the Democratic Party, that this is not a winning strategy. Yeah. That that, that to fall into the red baiting. Yeah. For Tim Ryan from my hometown, Youngstown, to say I'm running for president in order to run against socialism, it's a it's a falling into a right wing trap. It is. You know? It is absolutely. Um, just as surely as it would be if someone were to say, um, you know, that, that uh, racism wasn't a big deal, that only economic questions were, 
were paramount. Like the, you can't separate the um, progressive economic changes needed from the, the, the fight for equality. You have to pursue both or, or you're falling into the trap of the right. And to me, when, when these people say that, it's like they're running against you know, public institutions in the United States that work perfectly well, you know? They're running against the VA. They're running against the fire department. You know what I mean? They're well, running- there's, the But there's also this, this campaign to, that, that's really sneaky, right? Where you, I think about what happened with public schools. Um, you, you mount this campaign led by the right wing, um, but, but where the entire ruling class bought in for, for decades, defund them, attack them, um, then- Privatize them. Yeah, and then when the results of that strategy start to become apparent, you point the finger and say, oh, the public schools are failing and use that as an excuse for more privatization. Exactly. And it's the same thing that happened in Venezuela, right? You impose sanctions, you do everything you can to subvert and undermine and infiltrate. And then when those efforts work, you know, you point the finger and say, oh, socialism has failed. No, no, you, you destroyed it. And now you're, what was it? Somebody who was a, a guest on our show once said, uh, it's like somebody has got their hands around your throat uh, and they're choking you, but saying, um, man, you really need to learn how to breathe. <laughs> yeah. Good analogy. Good analogy. Well, you know, um, speaking of socialism, there was an article in the Washington Post yesterday um, that uh, pointed to the communist roots of the Republican Party, saying that, um, which we knew, but I'm glad it was brought forward, that Lincoln corresponded freely with Karl Marx. Who was, who was an admirer of, of, of Lincoln and certainly a supporter of the, the Northern side in the Civil War. Very much so, and that many German immigrants came over and fought on the side of the Union and against slavery and formed part of the base of the Republican Party, uh, along with supporters of a newspaper called the uh, New York uh, Tribune. And I think there was even a general in the Union Army, his name was Wedemeyer, who, who fought on and led oh. against the uh, slavocracy. So just, a, just a little plug here. Um, if you're interested, uh, international publishers has a volume of the writings of Marx and Engels on the Civil War uh, available for sale. Uh, it's recently been either republished or, or even re-edited, I'm not sure. Uh, so you can check that out at international publishers. Very good. And uh, we encourage everybody to uh, read it and to uh, you know, read the uh, article that I was just referencing. And you can find it um, on our uh, Facebook page has been posted there and there's been quite a discussion. I posted a meme, somebody sent me a meme of Marx, Engels, Lenin, and Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> With the article and oh my God, you can, I was really surprised by some of the responses, you know. Well, I, I didn't look it over, what, so what, what are people oh, saying? Uh, Lincoln uh, was no progressive. Uh, he only freed the slaves in the states that had seceded from the Union. That was a bunch of malarkey. What about those who stayed in? And uh, oh, he was uh, a uh, genocide practicer. He murdered Native Americans. Oh, he was a, you know. He said that he would prefer to, you know, keep the South without freeing the slaves, et cetera. Exactly, he would have done it. They, somebody sent the letter that he wrote to Mr. Greeley making that the point that uh, while as commander in chief, as president, his point was to save the union. Mm -hmm. If he could have saved the union without freeing the slaves, he would have done so, uh, so notwithstanding whatever his personal beliefs were, which he said were for freedom. Uh, but the point that we were trying to make with the meme and the article was to draw attention and the irony of the GOP's founding <laughs> is and it's, 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 which, which was founded in pro-labor to a certain degree in anti-slavery sentiment. And now it's um, anti-labor and pro-racist. Yeah, uh, I mean, it was, it was originally a party of free labor. 
um, free in the sense of not enslaved, not free in the sense of not. Free. No, you know that's that's uh, really an extremely important point. Certainly, during the Reconstruction period, it was Republicans who who were responsible for the the Thirteenth, Fourteenth, and Fifteenth Amendments for for all of the the progressive changes that that took place. Um, and so it's sad to see that the party has you know was taken. It became not a party of of free labor, but a party of, of cheap labor and a party of the corporate class. And of course, racism is their tool and it lost its connection to that. You use the phrase neo-confederacy, neo-confederate in your editorial, and uh, which is interesting because the attack on the elected officials today is reminiscent of the racist attack on the black elected officials during the reconstruction period. Absolutely. You know, and let's not forget what that led to. It led to disenfranchisement. It led to denial of the vote. Yeah, when you, when you say that that the president can can disqualify and dismiss a an elected representative, you know, whatever their their color, but but in this country, a, a black representative in particular, you're saying that you can also dismiss the votes of their constituents, and um, and that's consistent, of course, with the strategy. Of the GOP, which has been to disenfranchise um, poor and and minority voters, uh, and so the revolutionary task today, Scott, uh, of Marxists, of socialists, of communists, of left wing Democrats, of uh, decent minded people of whatever stripe, is, in your opinion. To elect Joe Biden, he's my homeboy, as you know. No, uh, the the ta the revolutionary task of all of those people that you named is to first get rid of the Trump regime, to decisively break the power of the corporate right. Um, and when I say neo confederacy, it's you know. I have this, I, maybe, perhaps I'm wrong, but I, I sort of have the suspicion that like the, when the Civil War was, was won, the state power of the Confederacy was never fully dismantled, right? It just sort of went underground, it reemerged here and there, and now it's, people are trying to reconstitute that. Um, so that must be finally, completely, entirely dismantled. Um, that's gonna that's gonna take a, a quite a quite a quite a doing quite a doing, uh, but in the first so where do we start, and even if the Democratic nominee is Biden, let me say it frankly, that tool will be used by the broad people's movement to defeat Trump. Yes, that's the most important issue, and nobody should have any illusions about that. We hope the progressive candidates win. We'll work towards that goal. So whatever the case may be, you know, you got to unite to defeat the right. That's the, uh, and, and, and we do that by putting forward, fighting for the independent and leading role of the trade unions and the working class in every possible way. And for the advancement of a people's agenda, the most progressive issue now is Medicare for all, Green New Deal, you know. And we have to, to recognize that you know, this, we have a tendency to give candidates a far too great a role in our understanding of the electoral process. It's not like, you know, oh, uh, Joe Biden or Beto O'Rourke become the nominee and all of a sudden, like their personal political vision is imposed on the entire, no, this is a, it's a, a dialectical process in which the, the people, um, hopefully under progressive working class leadership, um, have the primary role. So um, candidates, yes, we want the most progressive candidate possible, but um, the progressive movement will force even a less progressive candidate to, um, to adopt and force a less progressive candidate to adopt some progressive positions. In fact, as we saw with the Democratic Party platform in, in 2016, and you have the last word. Well, thank you for watching this week with the Communist Party. I've been here with Scott Hiley. Uh, good morning, revolution to 
everyone. We hope you have a, a great, great weekend. Uh, we, we encourage you to share our memes on uh, Facebook and in other uh, venues. This week we have uh, one on We Stand with the four members of Congress who have been under uh, attack. Uh, uh, we're with them. We encourage you to share it. We're putting up one on the a death penalty. The death penalty is not justice. It's the antithesis of ju justice, actually. And uh, check us out at uh, cpusa.org. Uh, uh, you'll find a number of articles by our writers, uh, some from the People's World. Scott, say good morning to your beautiful daughter. Have a great weekend. Will do. You too, Jim. And um, we'll be back next week. See you next week. All righty. Hey, did you just call? Yeah. Hey, Joe. Oh, sorry. Um, let me do that here. Talk to you later. Bye.